So um, this coming Friday, uh, my, our daughter Hillary is going to turn what, 22. And um, 22 years ago, um, I was a heavy, heavy, um, actually no, 20, just under 22 years ago, I was a heavy sleeper. But before that, I was not so heavy a sleeper. Before Hillary was born, um, you know, I'd, I'd go to bed at night, and, uh, and if the phone rang at 2 in the morning, I would just jump out of bed ready to face the world. Jana will tell you that it was the craziest thing. I mean, I could answer the phone. It would be like I'd never been asleep, uh, you know, a single minute. And then we brought Hillary home, and something changed. It was like uh, somebody flipped a switch, and I slept like a log. Um, I mean, uh, a tornado could have blown outside the house and it wouldn't have woken me up. And, um, and I still kind of that way. I sleep pretty hard at night. And, uh, and every once in a while I'll, I'll wake up kind of in the middle of the night, something will wake me up and I'll just go right back to sleep, you know, without just, all I have to do is just close my eyes and I'll fall right back to sleep. But a few weeks ago, something happened. Um, I woke up at four in the morning, my eyes just, just woke up and and I looked at the clock and, uh, and I saw what time it was and I thought, I gotta go back to sleep. I got a lot to do today. So I did what I always do. I closed my eyes, tried to, I had an apnea monitor. I put my mask back on because I'd somehow taken it off and I put it back on. That's usually a perfect recipe for instant sleep. And my eyes just shot open. So I tried again to go back to sleep and it didn't happen. I just woke up and so I... And, and, and it didn't really, it, it wasn't physically like this, but uh, before the apnea monitor, there would be times when I would have books and stuff thrown at me to keep me from snoring. Um, but, uh, but it wasn't like this, it, but I felt just something pushing me out of bed and I got out of bed. And I went downstairs and I knew, it, it wasn't an audible voice telling me this, to do this, but I knew that I had to sit down and open the Bible and read through the book of Ephesians, which I did. And for the next two and a half hours, I spent the deepest time in the book of Ephesians that I think I've ever spent. And it was an amazing time of worship with my Lord. I learned so much. There were some messages that came out of that time with, with Ephesians. The first was, was, a, a, was the message that I got from Ephesians 1.17 where Paul says this. He said, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. And I sensed the Lord in that moment saying, I want you to know me better. I want you to know me this morning. I want you to know me better. And I want to tell you, that's what I want for every single person who comes to this church. I want you to come to this church and know Jesus better. I mean, I, our, our purpose here at the church is to, is to make disciples who make disciples. And, and yet before that became our official stated purpose, whenever someone would ask me about what the purpose of the church is, I would say, well, our purpose is pretty simple. It's to, it's to, um, to help people who don't know Jesus come to know him and then to help people who do know him to know him better. It's a different way of saying to make disciples who make disciples because if you take a person and you introduce them to Jesus and then you help them grow in their faith, then guess what? They're gonna wanna share that faith. They're gonna become a disciple who makes disciples. And so, so to, to help people who know him come to know him better, I mean, that's our goal. And that's what Paul was about um, here in this first part of Ephesians. And, and it's why we have Bible studies here at the church so that you can, can learn about the word of God and come to know Jesus better. It's why we encourage you to be a part of a small group because of the connection that you make with other believers. It draws you closer to Jesus so that through it all, you will know him better. It's why we're constantly striving to remove whatever barriers might be in place in our church that would prevent us from sharing the gospel because I believe that we have good news to share with those in our community. I believe that, that we have good news to share with all people, whether they know Jesus or whether they don't. I believe that the good news that we have to share can change a life forever, not just on this side of eternity, but on the other side of eternity as well. And that is good news. 
I don't believe that Sunday after Sunday, I just stand up here and, and peddle a word that, that might make a difference. I believe that every single Sunday, whenever a message is preached or whenever a song is sung or whenever a worship service is held in this place, there is the potential in this space for lives to be changed and futures reshaped for Jesus. And that is good news. There was another verse in, in this text, another passage um, in, in Ephesians that I read that morning that sort of brings about the, the passion that Paul had for sharing this good news. He says this in Ephesians 3, 14 and following. He says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. He said, I, I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being through the power, uh, through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. He said, I pray that you will have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Can there be any better news than that? That a person would come to a place where they know the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge so that, so that they will then be filled with the fullness of God. Because once you find yourself in that place where you are filled with the fullness of God, you then know that you have a power that's at work within you that is able to accomplish abundantly far more than you could ever ask, hope, or imagine. And I'm gonna tell you, friends, that's what I want for you. That's what I want for my children. That's what I want for your children and for your grandchildren. I want them to come to that place where they know the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge, that causes them to come to that place where they are filled with the fullness of God so they then know that they have at work within them a power that is able to, to move them to where they can do abundantly far more than they could ever ask or imagine. That's the good news. And what I love about this letter to Ephesians is that Paul very clearly lays out how we're to accomplish this. In chapter four, verse one, Paul says this. He says, therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner that's worthy of the calling with which you've been called. Other translations say Paul says that, that I, a prisoner, beg you to, uh, to, to walk in a manner that's worthy of your calling. In other words, Paul is, is begging us. He's imploring us to spend our lives in such a way that we fulfill the calling that God has given us as followers of Jesus Christ. And that calling, that calling is to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and become mature believers. No longer children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, but mature in our faith. And this is what it accomplishes. He says this in verse four. He says, there is one body and one spirit. Just as also you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and who is through all and who is in all. Listen, friends, this is not about being Methodist or, or Baptist or, or Presbyterian. It's not about being conservative or, or liberal. It's not about being evangelical or charismatic or whatever other label you might try to assign to, to a particular preference of how a person lives out their faith. This is truly about recognizing that we're all in this thing together together. We're not to be pulling apart from each other. This is about coming together, recognizing that we're all in this together. It's why JJ's here today. It's why the Lord has led us to partner with one another in ministry. It's why the Lord has brought the two of us as individuals together. It's why the Lord put on JJ's heart a number of years ago that a, that a movement start among clergy in this area 
And we've been living out that that vision over the last couple of years with a group of clergy that, that meet on a regular basis to pray over one another and to pray with each other and to, to, uh, to, to get to know one another and to spend life and, and ministry together so that the people who live in the Bryan College Station area will come to know that we are unified in our, in our walk with Christ, that we serve one Lord and there's one faith and there is one baptism. We serve one God who is father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. It's why our church on the Monday after Easter launched into a prayer vigil. And the focus of that prayer vigil is unity. It's no accident that we're talking about our relationships with one another today. And the focus of that talk is unity. As I was preparing this message, JJ, I just got to tell you, I was overwhelmed at the fact that you're here today and that we're working together and we're doing this together. It's, it's what this is about. We need unity so badly in our community and in our churches today. Our world is in desperate need to see that unity manifest itself among Christians. Kent Hughes, in his book on Ephesians, writes this. He says this subject of unity has a special poignancy today in a world which has so failed in its attempts at unity and is so alienated. I was in my teens during the 50s, he said, when ecumenism was the big thing with the mainline denominations. But it all came to naught because, he says, it was based on an, on an eviscerated, spineless theology instead of a vertebrate system of Christian belief. He says, today, today the World Council of Churches is little more than a mouse that roared. He, he says, I was in my 20s during the 1960s, and, and I remembered visiting Haight-Ashbury in, in San Francisco. This was like a, I, I guess you... I guess it's kind of like a hippie commune in, in San Francisco. He said, I was being, when I went there, I was handed flowers and, and underground newspapers proclaiming a new day of peace. He said the, the bright colors were colors of optimism and the communes were wishful microcosms of a new order. But today, he said, all that is left are some middle-aged anachronisms, cultural dinosaurs giving testimony to the fact that we live in a cold and fragmented world. He said, I, I recently spoke to a young man who is so starved for attention that he has his hair cut once a week just to be touched by another human hand in a non-threatening manner. He says, life for so many in this world is like an elevator ride. Everyone facing forward, no, no eye contact, no conversation or interaction. And then everyone rushes off to their faceless endeavors. He said, the world is looking for a new humanity, a third race, which is not only walking in unity, but has open, inviting arms and hearts. And that's what we're to be after as we walk the walk of the Christian life. We're to be after that kind of unity. And, 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 and what's more, our, our walk of faith is not meant to be a solo effort. We're not to do this on our own. We, we're to walk with each other, not off in separate directions, but we're to walk toward each other so that we can experience the kind of unity that God longs for us to experience as the body of Christ. But so many times we miss it. So many times we get to think, and it's all about me. It's about my needs being met. It's about my hopes being dashed. And if, if, if I'm not happy, then nobody's going to be happy. You know? and, and, uh, and, 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 and yet, it's interesting. If you look at how Jesus ordered the church, it says in the fourth chapter of Ephesians that he, that he ordered the church in such a way he gave gifts to people. And, and, and he did it like this. The gifts he gave, this is... Ephesians 4.11, the gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers. And here, this was their purpose. Daniel, their purpose was not so that we would do all the work. Bruce, have you ever been a part of a church that expected you to do all the work of ministry? Yeah, it's not the way Paul set it up. 
He said the gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry. JJ, that, JJ that's what you're doing for that, with that school that you're wanting to create for people to learn how to go out and do what you've been doing for 25 years, right? He equipped them to, to do the work of ministry for the building up of the body of Christ until all of us come to, listen to this, until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must, I love this, we must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine or by people's trickery or by their craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body in all its differences, in all its unique parts, the whole until the whole body is joined and knit together by every ligament with which, is it equi- which with, with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth and building itself up in love. That's what this kind of unity looks like. It looks like all the parts of the body, all of you, in all your various unique ways works together in such a way that unity is obtained. But so many times we miss that. So many times we think it's all about us. I experienced that in my own body just this, just this past week. I, I, I stand here and testify, I was released from physical therapy this week. Now, you may not know this, but um, about a month and a half ago, I started having some pretty bad back trouble. It was such that it was constant. And Daniel will tell you that he, he would joke with me. He'd call me old man when I'd get up out of a chair because I couldn't straighten up and I'd walk. And, and I went to the chiropractor and the chiropractor um, said, I'm going to send you to physical therapy. And I thought, yes, because I had this image of what physical therapy was going to look like. And, and I was going to get to go twice a week, he told me. And, and this is what I imagined. I imagined I was going to go in to the physical therapy office and, and they were going to have a table that was set aside just for me. And they would turn the lights down. There'd be a candle burning and I would get deep tissue massages while soft music was playing. And then I would stand up when it was over and be ready to conquer the world. Instead, I walked in to the physical therapy office the first day and they said, okay, I want to take a look, bend over. And I went like this. Isn't that great? And then they, they, um, they started me on something that was just short of what it must feel like to be in hell. <laughs> I... I I mean, I, I, uh, it was a long time before I felt a deep tissue massage. They had me marching with weights on my feet. They had me holding myself up in a sit-up position for 30 seconds, three times, and, until my arms were just like shaking. And, and I'm saying, wait a minute, my back hurts. And they said, yeah, but we got to strengthen your core. And I'm thinking, you got to be kidding me. And it, it was, It hurt. And I'm on a treadmill and I'm walking and I'm tired and I'm thinking, I just can't go on. But I got to tell you, a week and a half into it, the pain began to subside. And I couldn't believe it because I thought it was all about rubbing my back. But they said, no, there's some other things going on in your body that's causing your back to be in this place where it's in pain. And so they worked out these other parts of my body and all of a sudden, I can stand before you now And I don't feel any pain. Of course, somebody walked up to me after church and said, let me see you touch your toes. (laughs) Not going to happen. But but there's this, there's the, the, God set this up so that our body, our body would function in such a way that unity springs up. And, and, and he said the, the, the way in which we walk this out, there are going to be some specific characteristics that, that, that govern the way we walk this faith out. One of those characteristics, well, he said it like this in Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. He said, walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. There are four different characteristics that he, that he uses to describe this walk of faith. The first is humility. 
that our walk of, uh, as a Christian is going to be defined, first and foremost, by humility. And a lot of people wonder, you know, what, what does this humility look like? Well, the best way I know how to describe it is, is to say that, that living a life that's grounded in humility is a life that places Christ first, others second, and self last. Christ first, others second, and self last. Last. Now, I'm going to tell you, that's not a very popular way to live. In fact, the kind of people that you see in the public arena today, they sort of flip that. Self first, others second, Christ last. That's not the way of humility at all. In fact, one person just defines humility as a lowliness of mind toward one's own merit. It's, it's Christ-like. In fact, Jesus said about himself in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, he said, come to me, all you who are weary and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest for I am meek and lowly in heart. It's the only time Jesus ever described his own temperament. And he described it as meek and lowly in heart. So our, our walk is gonna be defined by humility. It's also gonna be defined by gentleness. And I will tell you that I've, I've believed this myself. A lot of us see the word gentleness as a synonym for weakness. But that's hardly the case. In fact, if you look at the etymology of the word gentleness, the etymology of the word gentleness is actually, it actually refers to strength under control. In fact, it was, it was often used to describe a horse that's been broken. Now, and you know horses pretty well, right? But it, and horses are pretty strong. But is, is a broken horse any less strong than an unbroken horse? No, not at all. It's just that the strength is under control. One person suggests that gentleness is, is an absence of any disposition to assert any personal rights. That's strength under control. Jesus was like this. He was humble and he was gentle. And the point of all of this is, 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 that, is that if you live your life in a manner that's worthy of the calling to which you've been called, if you live your life patterned after the example that Jesus has set, if you walk the walk that Jesus walked, then, then the world's going to notice. You're not going to have to wear a name tag that says, I'm a Christian. You're not going to have to wear a big cross around your neck. You're not going to have to slap stuff onto your car. People are going to know that you are a follower of Jesus because of what they see in you. They'll see humility. They'll see gentleness. And then finally, they'll see patience and showing tolerance for one another. Now, I'll speak about that word tolerance. I don't like the way that word is being thrown around in our culture today. Because you know, you know this. I mean, if you attempt to show any kind of conviction about something, guess what people are going to say about you? They're going to say you're intolerant, right? And then I look at Jesus. I mean, Jesus had the deepest, strongest, and most solid set of convictions anybody on this planet has ever manifest. And yet he was the most gracious person when he was with sinners. But he never once laid a demand on them that was inappropriate. Paul talks about, about patience and, and tolerance here that, that grows out of love. It's what Jesus was talking about in the prayer that he prayed over his disciples in John 17 when he prayed, prayed I have, God, I have given them the authority that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. It's about living our lives in unity in such a way that when people see us, they see him. That's what he's praying for. That's why living in such a way that unity prevails is so vitally important. We need this so badly today to experience this kind of unity. And Paul knew, Paul knew that this wasn't going to be easy. He knew that it was going to take a lot more than just begging people to live in unity by walking in humility and gentleness and patience and tolerance and love. And so he spells it out at the end of chapter four of Ephesians. And this is what he said. First, he said this, putting away falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors. 
for we are members one of another. In other words, what he's saying is very simple. Don't lie to one another. Don't lie to one another. Speak the truth to one another. And yes, yes, there will be times when, when the truth hurts and so you gotta speak the truth in love, but don't lie to one another. I mean, with, I mean lying destroys trust. And without trust, unity can never prevail. I mean, JJ, I remember the first, one of the first meetings we had of those clergy, we asked them, you know, what is it that's keeping us apart? And, and if, you would, if, if I were to kind of quote some of the folks, they would say, we don't trust you. We don't trust you. I mean, some of the people that come into your home, they don't trust you probably. But I'll tell you what, if we lie to one another, there's no way unity can prevail because we will not trust one another. So, so put away falsehood. Speak truth. Speak truth. Speak it in love if truth is going to hurt. But speak the truth. And then he says this in verses 26 and 27. Be angry, but do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger and do not make room for the devil. Now I'm going to tell you, this does not mean that you shouldn't get angry. You're going to get, if you're in relationship with another person, you are going to get angry with that person. This does not mean don't get angry, but what it does mean is you got to handle your anger properly. I mean, if you hold anger in that you have toward another person, that anger is just going to become a cancer inside of you that will continue to grow and it will continue to metastasize until you, you end up growing bitter toward that person so that whenever you see that person, if you've not dealt with this anger in a healthy way, whenever you see that person, you're going to get mad all over again. How many of you have had that happen? Don't raise your hand. But you know it to be true. When you allow anger to, do, to, to be nursed inside of you, you give the devil a foothold in your life. And I'll tell you what he's gonna do. He's gonna start working through that anger inside of you. And he's gonna, he's gonna try to, in your mind, blow things completely out of proportion so that division will reign instead of unity. I'm going to tell you, anger not dealt with properly within the body of Christ splits churches. Second community I, I served, Jana and I had just gotten married and we moved to Normandy. And, uh, and in downtown Normandy, there were two Baptist churches that were just two blocks away from each other. Of course, there was First Baptist Church that had been there forever. And then there was another church that was two blocks away. And, uh, and the word that, that I heard was that, uh, that that other church formed because of a split. There, you see, there was an argument that, that, that arose amongst the members of First Baptist Church about, about whether you should bale the cotton with, when square bales or round bales. And, and, and they just got all bent out of shape. And so some of them left that church and they started a new church. Guess what they named the new church? Harmony Baptist Church. <laughs> there were 10 different Baptist churches within about a five mile radius of Normandy. And all of them, I guarantee were started because of a split that had occurred in another church. Anger not dealt with properly within the body of Christ will split churches. So be angry, but don't sin. And don't let the sun go down on your anger. Deal with it in a timely manner. And then the next thing he says in, four, in Ephesians 4.28, thieves must give up stealing Rather, let them labor and work honestly with their own hands so as to have something to share with the needy. It's why you guys are building that shop and starting a vocational school so you can help people learn to, to work with their hands. And because we're called by God as followers of Jesus Christ to treat other people right, to show honor and respect to other people. We're to be givers, not takers. And then he says this, he says, let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up as there is need so that your words may give grace to those who hear. Friends, please don't overlook this word. This may be one of the most important pieces of advice that we will hear in this text as it relates to how we interact with one another within the body of Christ. The way we talk to one another matters. 
It matters deeply. Do you ever find a need to, uh, to talk about somebody else to another person? Don't do it. I'm speaking to, to myself as well as you. We gotta stop that sort of stuff. I mean, when did sharing a little gossip about, other, about another person ever build that other person up? When did talking behind another person's back ever promote unity? It doesn't. And I'm gonna tell you this. If you've got something against another person, work it out. Work it out. I mean, I, I think I remember Jesus saying, you know, if you come to the altar and you, you get to the altar to bring your gift to the altar and you recognize as you get to that altar that, 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 that somebody has something against you, you have something against somebody else, leave your gift there at the altar and go work it out with that other person. Just do it. But let me, let me recommend this. Don't try to work it out over email, for goodness sake. You laugh because you've tried it. And you know it doesn't work. I have tried it. Too many times, and I should have learned each time. It doesn't work. I, I preached a memorial service yesterday for someone. Some of you may have been there. He had started a family business, and they, they had a rule that, that he had established in their company that if you have an issue with a coworker, don't try to work it out through email. You can't adequately communicate emotion through email. I have messed up relationships because I've tried to do stuff through email too many times. He told, he told his employees, don't do it through email. Get up out of your chair and go into another person's office and work it out. Work it out. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up as there is need so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And then he says this, finally, he says, put away from you all bitterness and wrath. Actually, I really don't want you to miss this. Let's read this together. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God and Christ has forgiven you. I want to ask you something. Can you imagine what our church would be like if we as a community of believers put that into practice every day without fail? Can you imagine what it would be like if we would do this, if we would put behind us bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God as Christ has forgiven us? Do you know what would happen if our church lived that out without exception? I will tell you this, we would not have room to hold all the people who would want to be a part of that kind of body of believers. And I'll tell you, if the churches in the Bryan College Station area would live this out in their churches and, and among one another, we would not have have enough churches to hold the people that would want to be a part of that kind of movement. It's that important. And so what's keeping us from doing it? What's keeping us from living that out? I'll tell you one thing. It's thinking that we can do this on our own. I said something last week that I, I wish I could qualify. I said how important it is, it would be for us to try to imitate God. <laughs> you can't do that. You can't do that on your own. Only through the power of the Holy Spirit can you do that. And so every one of us in this room, if we believe that there's a possibility that this could make a difference among us and in this community, need to spend some time in prayer asking the Holy Spirit to work in our lives to empower us to live that out. And see what happens. And see what happens. So I want to close with a few verses that I've already read, but I want to change them a little bit. In Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 3, Paul, Paul begins by saying, I, therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, I want to change that beginning this way. I, your pastor beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you've been called with all humility and gentleness 
in patience, bearing with one another in love, and making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And I offer that prayer in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious God.